If you're not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now, along with the bell icon so you can be notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you're already subscribed, check and make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you. And of course, be sure to give the video a like as well as share it on your social media. The white supremacists hate that. And at the end of this video is going to be a special notice regarding the uploading schedule for the next week. And now, the Sunday Address. As black people, we are inundated with distractions. Biden's orgy of hot air calling itself a State of the Union Address will give in his cognitive decline, which at this point is teetering towards full-blown dementia. State of confusion is what they should have called it. MSNBC tried to treat it like some glorious symphony of ideas, but it's more like a gang of flat notes. He was trying to put duct tape on the fact that the cost of living crisis is still high as ever, and he also blamed the border crisis on the Republicans. Now that would have carried more weight if it wasn't for the fact that black voters handed Democrats control of the Congress and the presidency for the first two years of his administration. So Republicans were not an obstacle from 2020 until early 2023. And by the way, when it comes to partisan divide, remember Republicans joined with Democrats to pass a federal gay marriage law right after their 2022 midterm victory. The Republicans didn't filibuster that law. They didn't add any poison pills to the legislation to kill it either. And of course, Biden's remarks about Gaza were meant to mollify the activists who have been giving him such a hard time for the last couple of months. And it says a lot that the coverage outside of the white corporate media refers to the war in Israel as the war in Gaza. Even some of the on-air talent on cable TV referred to the Gaza war. Biden's handling, or rather mishandling, of the Gaza issue isn't going over well at all with younger voters, especially those on college campuses. Biden's been avoiding going to universities for this exact reason. Now, if he can't reach out to younger voters, he's going to be politically crippled. But then again, he's already chosen political paralysis because even if he could get younger voter support, he's already lost the black vote by and large. He didn't even bother to say anything about black voters at all, which lets you know what he's offering us. Four years ago, Biden was offering us very little. This time, it's nothing at all. And that's important to make note of because we had a whole bunch of Biden bots four years ago who were saying that, oh, Joe Biden's going to produce big things for the black community because of the 2020 uprisings. He knows what will happen if he doesn't. Well, here we are four years later. Have you seen all of those policies that Biden has enacted to benefit black people? Me neither. And to show just how effective the black media has been at fighting against the propaganda, you notice that this go-round, we haven't had the tsunami of all of these Biden bots online calling themselves pushing the same old soap. That's because we have kept at it, reminding you day after day we haven't gotten anything. We've made it where there hasn't been this vacuum of information, where they can just stick their heads up after a while because people have moved on. We ain't moved on for nothing. Black empowerment is not a one-time thing. It's not for one election cycle. It is all day, every day for us. And that's why the online shills have, by and large, had to lay low. Yeah, you don't see the same old people who are out there reposting the same old crap because they know it's not going to work. Because we haven't allowed it to have room to work. And you haven't either. Keep in mind, when I say black media, that means you. And none of the white media's black bootlicks on TV have mentioned the fact that ignoring the black vote's going to cost Biden the election. Notice how none of them have been saying that. Usually after the State of the Union address, you sit there and say that he has to cater to this or that constituency. Oh, the president's got to go ahead and speak to this or that because if he doesn't, it's going to cost him votes. None of them, not even one of them, has said a word about the fact that, hey, black voters are the party's base and Biden's completely and thoroughly ignored them. Gee, didn't he make some loose talk four years ago about having the black communities back? Yeah, that's where he put the knife. This is why it was important to highlight what Jason Johnson said. The refusal of these Negro puppets you see on TV or in print who refuse to mention black voters, that's not some oversight on their part. It is a deliberate and I would say coordinated agenda on their part given to them as their marching orders from their white political masters. But I wouldn't look for them to merely stop at the benign neglect. I think the next step is going to be for them to go full nigga Jim Clyburn and to openly and viciously attack the black community for even daring to make any demands. Whenever they say, y'all gonna cost us the election, that's just a variation on, you're gonna ruin it for the rest of us. That's what's going on here. But we're not gonna stop pressing our demands. We're not even gonna slow down with the demands. We're definitely not gonna water down the demands. So expect to see the brow beating and the haranguing of the black community become even more intense, become even more shameless. 
And don't be surprised when you see some people who in the past have pretended like they were with the angels all of a sudden parroting the exact same line about, well, the black community's concerns is important, but um, it's too dangerous. To look at the fascism on the march, fascism on the march. Nobody's going to be going to Biden and doing what the Arab voters have said. They've said, hey, if fascism takes over the country, it's because Joe Biden didn't think that America was important enough to save. They put the onus on him where it belongs. And the white media is not attacking them for that, not demonizing them for that. You don't have any equivalent of Jim Clyburn saying, stop sloganizing, stop sloganizing. Gaza is just one small place, stop sloganizing. Sloganizing kills. You don't see anyone doing that. Yeah, they only saved that for the black community. And there was a time, a very long time, that those kind of tactics worked. But at long last, a few generations have now arisen who are not going for that. We have closed our ears to any of these kind of bullying tactics. Finally, enough of us have gotten tired of being offered nothing burgers three squares a day. So we're putting our foot down. We didn't expect him to address or even mention black people's interests during his State of the Union address, and he didn't disappoint or surprise us on that one. But that's not to say that these guys are going to stop it with trying to use some insidious means to undermine us. There's people who want us to stop doing what we're doing, and it's not just the white supremacists or these bootlicks either. See, white supremacists, they fear the issue of reparations, because the racial wealth gap is the main thing that gives tangible benefits to being classified as white. That's the primary goodies and guarantees and giveaways the white supremacy offers up. Reparations would balance that out and eliminate those advantages. Without that, white supremacy has nothing meaningful to offer as an incentive to the rank and file. The bootlicks fear reparations because they've bet everything on white supremacy remaining in place. And even with reparations, they don't want to build black empowerment. They want to maintain a place under white supremacy because a pet would never think of biting its master's hand. Even if you open the door to the cage, they still don't want to be free. And then there's the third group. These bootlick adjacents, they don't have a comfortable place under white supremacy, but if they were offered one, they wouldn't mind. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you having heard this are thinking, oh, you're talking about the A-Dunce clowns, right? Well, in part, they're part of a larger group of individuals who may not necessarily be on white supremacy's payroll, but would like to be there. But I'm talking about these individuals like the ones who said that reparations would never be a political issue. Oh, it ain't gonna happen. Y'all just talking reparations. Ain't nobody else who's gonna say that. They said that we didn't have the power to force the word into the media discourse. And then it happened. And those same people, they then said that, well, that don't mean nothing. Couple of segments on the nightly news, that don't mean nothing. You don't see no politicians nowhere saying reparations. None of them at all. And they ain't going to. Only thing is, y'all the ones saying it. Ain't nobody else doing it. And then the politicians began saying reparations. And then these bootlick adjacents said, well, that don't mean nothing. Ain't going to be no legislation nowhere. Ain't no city, ain't no state, much less the federal government ever going to pass no reparations, nothing. Heck, they ain't even going to do no empty proposals. And then they started doing the do-nothing proposals. They started flooding the zone with these cities, making all sorts of asinine do-nothing proposals, claiming that, oh, a tiny housing voucher. See, this is reparations. And then claiming that, well, we got an idea for some school vouchers. Yeah, you can go to a white-owned school. Yeah, reparations. Well, there's some loose talk about an apology from the mayor's office. Oh, see, that? that that's reparations. And these were Democrats doing this, not just Republicans. So what does that tell you? Both political parties are on board with the idea that cash reparations should never happen. And a lot of people are saying, well, this is going to wear down those angry folks online. It's going to wear them down. But it didn't. That's the problem that they happen to have. Now what they're saying is, well, OK, there may be some of these stalling tactics, but ain't going to be no cash reparations be made. Notice how you have a lot of people who claim to be down with black empowerment, but they're the main ones saying what ain't going to happen. And then when it does happen, none of them says, you know what? I was wrong. Hey, maybe you guys out here, you actually know what you're talking about in the black media. They don't say that. What does that tell you? There are a lot of Negroes who are actually betting against our empowerment. And they're the ones who we not only need to be on the lookout for, we need to be also pointing the finger at them and letting them know you can't be around here. This is the reason why I have a strictly enforced zero tolerance policy for defeatist talk. I don't allow people to come around here and start telling the troops what we can't do and what's not going to happen. The greatest single determinant in whether or not someone can do something is whether or not they believe it. That is the most important factor. So no, around here, we don't do any of that. What ain't going to happen? The main reason things haven't happened for us is because too many black folks have a very tiny attention span and they don't believe in putting much effort behind things. We have only put a little effort behind this. Get us some resources. And what happens is this becomes an effort that feeds on itself. That's what white supremacy is scared of. 
You got some Negroes out here who are actually serious about changing the status quo. Right now, they're doing with very little. You let these people get their hands on some resources, and well, let's just say that the Israeli lobby, they ain't seen nothing yet. This is the reason why I went into details for years now, telling you that we can make reparations a reality, but we also need to understand white supremacy is not going to do it willingly. What they're going to do is try to stall us out, wait us out, try to see how serious we are about this issue, because they know that the bought and paid for bootlicks like in Cobra and these safe Negroes, these unthreatening Negroes that you see on TV and in print, they would never push reparations as a political issue. Because the purpose of bootlicks is to be controlled opposition. But when the grassroots began to mobilize, and we haven't stopped, white power is so scared they can't make it a major issue. So instead, they're trying to do some empty gestures, which they call reparations, and then they'll claim, see, we did exactly what you told us. And of course, they would have their bootlick friends out there say, yep, 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 this is exactly what we told Mass and we wanted. White power would try to redefine what qualifies as reparations. I've been telling you that for years now. First thing that they're seeing is when we didn't drop it, okay, now there's going to be carpet bombing us with all of these propaganda stories saying, well, reparations actually means a housing voucher, uh, some money for an HBCU, uh, maybe we rename a street after Dr. Cat. that's reparations, some feel-good stuff. They made a big deal about Bruce's Beach being returned to its original owners, but as I explained to you, they had already long before put laws and zoning restrictions in place, making it where you can't develop the area. So all of the white folks out there who have been able to take advantage of the last hundred years of development and been able to build up the value of the property and also solidify their ability to hold it, they're going to be able to keep their land there. But the black owners of Bruce's Beach, they've already said they're going to have to sell it. This is what the government and the white media wants you to think of as restoring land to black people. Yeah, having economically starved us for 500 years and making it where we don't have the ability to actually gain land, that means you don't have the ability to hold on to it either. This is the reason why cash reparations is important. Land doesn't mean all that much if you don't have the ability to hold on to it, and you're going to need money to do that. I know that a number of you are big on the idea of land as reparations. There's nothing wrong with that, but just understand something. You're not going to be able to have the ability to develop any parcel of land without money. Even if you were given a hundred years of tax-free status, that still wouldn't help you when it comes time to develop it. You would be forced to have to let some white developer or investor have a piece of your land. And then what happens is before it's all over, they'll be trying to force you out or rezone you out or otherwise find some little dirtbag move that edges you out. That's the reason why the money comes first. But we have to also understand the carpet bombing of propaganda is going to intensify. We have not gone for a redefinition of reparations. We have instead doubled down on cash reparations. You got these cities and states claiming that they're going to be giving you tiny housing vouchers or whatever. These are just nothing more than gestures meant for the end goal of bestowing innocence on themselves. This is about short-circuiting and derailing reparations, not about actually promoting it or making it happen. And then they'll make sure to have their Negro sock puppet standing there for the cameras, repeating masses lies, endorsing anything other than cash reparations. And there absolutely must be political consequences and repercussions for that. Negroes who make it a point, especially at this late date, that they're going to be selling us out and they're going to be sitting here and endorsing things that they know are nothing more than a swindle and nothing more than a con job and a fraud. There absolutely have to be repercussions and political consequences for that. And this is what the bootlicks are betting on. What they're betting on is that Massa can hand them just enough crumbs to be able to hold on to whatever patron position that they have. But I think that as black people, we need to understand, while voting at the federal level doesn't really yield big results, voting locally does. But we have to also make sure that if we're going to be voting, we vote for the right people. It's important that folks decide that they're going to get off the sidelines and into the game. That's something that the bootlicks never see coming, and it works more often than not. Our problem is we haven't been consistent about it. This is the reason that the Democrats think that they can get away with their little political sideshows, like the one they put on at Congress where they were claiming that they were having a congressional reparations hearing. But at the very least, there was one beneficial thing that came out of that sham. I've always had a number of people over the years who didn't like the fact that I was heavily critical of Tommy Heasy Coates. I didn't really have anything all that great to say about the guy. A lot of people who thought that I just had him wrong or didn't understand him. But after that so-called reparations hearing, I noticed that those detractors stopped altogether. Yeah, you couldn't deny the fact that Tani Hisi Coates is exactly what I said he is, a sellout. Why do you think it is that a publication with the prestige of The Atlantic gave him column space so that he could go ahead and say, the case for reparations? They were already laying the groundwork, just in case the black grassroots 
didn't stop with the reparations thing. They needed somebody who they could claim has credibility on it. So they claim, oh, he's controversial. Oh, you know, he says some things that give some of these white power brokers heartburn. And that being the case, you need to listen to this guy. That's the whole point. If you're going to have a shill out here who's supposed to be controlled opposition, you got to give him some thin veneer of credibility. At the very least, you need to be able to point and say, see, he's got a track record of saying things that kind of sound like what these folks at the grassroots level have been saying. That was the entire reason that they had him doing that. This is what white power believes in doing. They believe in going ahead and having their operatives out there and having them out there early. Try to manufacture a track record for them. However thin. But lip service is no service at all. Ta-Nehisi Coates has never pushed for cash reparations. That's the thing I never liked about this guy. He never put a dollar figure on it. And when it came time for him to publicly talk about it, was the first thing he did. He rolled right over and said, well, reparations could be lots of things. No, reparations is one thing and one thing only. Cash. When he had the public opportunity to go on the record, he showed you where he really stood. Only the black media has demanded cash reparations. See, white power is trying to wear us down. For 150 years, black people have had this horrible habit of only pursuing things just so far. White power has seen this. So they count on us doing the same thing about reparations. All they have to do is wait us out, stall, drag their feet, and we will predictably get tired, go away, because we always have. And this is where these defeatist talking people online, this is where I have to have them banished immediately. I don't tolerate them. They play into white supremacy's hands. For the last 150 years, you've had this rump contingent of house Negroes and wannabe house Negroes. They are the enemy within. They're not black first. They're attack the black community first. Blame the black community first. Discourage the black community first. Since we walked off the plantations, they've been the main ones telling us to just settle for whatever massa sees fit to do. Don't make no demands now. And whenever we do demand something, they're the first ones telling us it's unrealistic, can't be done, shouldn't be demanded. And during chattel slavery, they were the ones who said that we could never break those slave chains. And then we did. But they wish we hadn't. Their attempts to demoralize us failed. I said that reparations is an excellent issue for us because it's an aggressive idea that will require white power to be stripped of its power. It's a big muscular issue that pushes a lot of buttons and it's undeniably a threat to white supremacy and to those who depend on it. So only people who are serious about fighting white supremacy, only people who are serious about black empowerment would support it. And that's the reason why your so-called civil rights organizations have all refused to even mention reparations and none of them supports cash reparations. So much for them being for black empowerment, huh? In fact, when these do-nothing fossils from the 60s have weighed in on reparations, they explicitly say that they oppose cash reparations, which means they're against reparations, period. When the San Francisco NAACP put out a press release and public statements saying that they oppose cash reparations, they didn't go rogue. They were not speaking out of turn or just speaking for themselves. Their opposition to cash reparations directly reflects that of the NAACP leadership if they can be called that. They did this in San Francisco, no less, in the state of California. And as we all know, as goes California, so goes the nation. And that's exactly what all of these civil rights retreads fear. They are scared of the fact that they thought that they had the black community on lock. And what they found out was the black community was sick and tired of them and could not wait to have some real people who are talking some real empowerment. That's what they're afraid of. And it's our job to make sure that their worst nightmare comes true. But the name of the game here is persistence. This is not going to be a one-and-done anything. And the people who are looking for an out, let them go. They were never with us to begin with. This is for the lifers. This is for the ones who actually are serious about this. And we know that Joe Biden's not for it, but this is about us showing that we are for it. I'm far less concerned with what the Democrats are not doing than I am with what we are doing. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And while we're on the subject of ceremony without substance, you got the Oscars. It's only worth mentioning because black people oversample when it comes to entertainment. What that means is we watch it more than other groups. And that would make sense if black people were the main ones who own these movie studios and these television networks, but we don't. So we're watching a bunch of brainwashing and programming being handed to us by our enemy. That story never has a happy ending. Entertainment is escapism. Now, it's one thing to take a break. It's another thing entirely to be constantly seeking an escape. This is the reason why black people love comedy so much. Escapism becomes dangerous when you're trying to escape from the real world. If there is a circumstance or a situation that happens to be so damaging, so undesirable, that you're constantly trying to get away from it, 
Rather than spending your time looking for a diversion, you need to be investing your time into changing that situation. This is the problem that black people are refusing to face, and it's high past time that we did it. For those of you sitting on the edge of your seats to see who's going to win Best Actor or Best Picture, understand something. Not one of those white actors or directors or producers or any of those white media personalities will ever be asked to speak on anything political, especially not as it pertains to the white community. You will never see anyone asking Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt's opinion about why white suicide rates are so high. Nobody's going to be asking Leonardo DiCaprio or Angelina Jolie to chime in about maternal or infant mortality rates. Black actors and singers, on the other hand, are treated as black America's leaders. And a large part of the reason happens to be that we flock to them, and this is not okay. You've heard me say for 15 years, and I will continue to say, do not look for black celebrities and any of these people that you see on TV to be helping us do anything. Sure, you will have the occasional, very rare exception, like, say, a Tashina Arnold. Somebody who actually is not afraid to actually be seen liking what it is that we're doing or giving us a salute. But the problem is that's going to be the exception, not the rule, and we got to be realistic about that. This is why when talking about what we need, we keep on bringing up the names of black actors and celebrities. Somebody actually mentions Tyler Perry. Let me tell you something. The black business class, the investor class, they're missing an action in our community, and we need to accept that. Now, here's the good news. The only reason that your black investor class or corporate class has any sort of economic underpinning is because they've actually been dealing with black people at the grassroots. You and I are the ones who empower these guys. You and I are the ones responsible for where they are. If you go straight to the source, the source is not Tyler Perry. The source happens to be all of those black people who take their hard-earned money and put it into Tyler Perry's pockets. Now, when you start looking at it from that angle, which, by the way, is the angle that Tyler Perry looks at it from, then you're going to start thinking a lot differently about whether or not you would even want to fool with any of these black celebrities. Learn to see the world the way that your opponent does. Not because I think that you should agree with them, or because I think that they're right, wrong on both counts, but because by looking at things the way that your opponent does, you can see his vulnerabilities and his weaknesses. And that's key to victory. These are just a couple of the failings and failures that we're going to have to have the moral courage and intellectual honesty to confront. Some of the people trying to discourage us and tear us down and spread bad information and advice are going to be people who try to palm themselves as being one of us. We have to take this opportunity to reinforce and renew our resolve that we are not going to play the fool for anyone. That when we said that we are on the road to black empowerment, we were dead serious about it. And we're not sitting here waiting for someone to do something for us. What we are doing is we are building our strength so that we can get it done for ourselves. Do not let anybody discourage you from the path that you're on. Persistence is how we get there. And when you say that reparations, when you say that black empowerment is what we're all about, and somebody tells you reasons why it couldn't happen, shouldn't happen, or why you don't need it, ask them what alternative are they offering. And what you'll find is they're not offering an alternative at all. We spend all day every day talking about what is the future of our people going to be. So we don't have any patience for anyone who tells us we don't need to think about it. What they're really saying is you don't have a future. Well, that's not somebody I want to keep company with, and I'm confident that you don't either. Biden's refusal to mention black people's interest at all, in fact, I don't think he even mentioned black people, period, that was not done merely as some sort of stoic defiance. It was done out of fear. His wobbly little knees were just sitting there knocking like a drum solo. It's because of the fact that he understands. You mentioned black people, they're going to be coming up to you and saying, now, what are you putting in our hands? That's not a conversation he wants to have. That's why they send out the Simone Mamie Sanders and they send out the Jim Clyburns and other suck-ups. You are the one who caused that to happen. You're the reason that they're scared to bring it up because now you've made it where this happens to be a political third rail. Their entire mission is to continue their agenda of forcing black people to be a permanent economic and political underclass. And you've been the main one saying we're not having it. That is the level of consistency and persistence that's going to be required to change our condition. Those of you who are with it, let's march on. And all the others, leave them where you found them. And that concludes this Sunday evening address. As mentioned at the very beginning, there is a notice regarding the uploading schedule. There's going to be a brief hiatus for about the next week or so, though your morning briefings will resume on the 18th. As always, the black media is more than any one person, even those who are behind the microphone are simply mouthpieces. 
You are the black media. But if any of the enemies are out there listening, be they the white supremacists, the bootlicks, or the bootlick adjacents, and they're thinking to themselves that maybe they can breathe easy for a little bit, don't dream. All of the people that you see here, the B-1 Brigade, you better believe they're going to be giving you that work. Because so long as our people do not have our power, you won't be allowed to have any rest. Good evening, and B-1. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Hildman Gallo, Frederica Moore, Frank Stalker, Brenda Starr, and Brandon Cherry. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.